Good afternoon, everybody. It's time to get started with our panel discussion. Um, I think we've had lots of introductions this morning. I think you all know I'm Howard Dobson, um, and I'm going to be the moderator for the panel discussion for the next hour and a half or so. Um, we've had some tremendous presentations this morning, and now we're going to get a little bit more focused, and I'm going to ask questions to each of the panel members, and we're go hopefully going to generate some discussion. It's not necessarily one panel member responds. I'm inviting the other panel members to chime in and say what you think. By all means, disagree, because, you know, disagreement is wonderful stuff and it helps us move forward. And I've got a series of questions. There's a few natural breaks in between each section of questions. So at that point, we'll turn it over to the audience to ask questions of the panel directly, and we'll have time for one or two questions at each sec section. So I'm going to start with um, introductions of the panel. Uh, we've all agreed that we're on first name terms for this, so we're going to be very informal. And I'm going to start with Michelle, who's the one I can see um, at this end of the panel. So Michelle, if you could perhaps introduce yourself, please. Sure. You guys hear me okay? There we go. Um, so my name is Michelle Black. I'm a, a veterinary and surgical oncologist um, and clinician scientist. And so I work specifically, I work at the OVC in the um, small animal clinic, um, mostly in the cancer center. And uh, my research focuses on comparative cancer investigation and the use of novel um, diagnostics and therapeutics um, for both cancer and other kind of aspects of of surgery research and specifically looking at translational models and how we can consider companion animals as translational models. So a lot of my focus is around um, companion animal benefit as well as human benefit and sort of where that intersection is with clinical trials. Um, so my expertise is mostly on the clinical trial side. Thank you, Michelle. Scott, you're next. I'm Scott Woodrow, um, CEO of ABC Intelligence, which is a, uh, a research software platform. Um, but that was really a spin out of another company I founded called Animal Health Partners. You might be familiar with Animal Health Partners, I'm not sure, from the chair here. Um, and that company was founded together with myself and an individual named David Jaffrey from University Health Network. So David and I founded that Ooh, we started operations in 2019, but the premise of Animal Health Partners was really to utilize the collective knowledge of both human and, and, and veterinary knowledge and bring it together for the betterment of both species and create a data model that can be translated on both sides. As we know, the data model is not 100% translatable, so that's what ABC Intelligence does. Is it works to translate the data for a truly comparative purpose and to easy, more easily access clinical trials uh, across species. Thank you, Scott. Sarah? Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah LePage, and I am the manager of cell and gene therapy training programs at an organization called CCRM, which is the Center for Commercialization of Regenerative Medicine. So CCRM is based out of Toronto, and they're an organization that helps support translational research from um, through tech transfer and also in manufacturing. So we serve as a contract development manufacturing organization um, and take early academic discoveries in stem cells and cell therapies and gene therapies, do tech transfer with the technology and eventually serve to manufacture those technologies through phase one and eventually phase two, three and uh, clinical trials and then commercialization. I also have an adjunct uh, professorship in the Department of Biomedical Sciences here in the OVC. Thank you, Sarah. Betsy, it's over to you. <laughs> okay, whatever. Uh, hi, everybody. Betsy McGregor. Um, I am uh, delighted to be here. I'm a grandmother, mother of a former pro hockey player in Europe, and I am founder of the World Women's Veterinary Medical Association, which went on to fund projects in developing nations around the world and was one of the predecessors of Veterinarians Sans Frontier and also the Women's uh, Leadership Board in APEC Nations, and author of the first ever chapter uh, in UNESCO's World Science Report, which addressed the uh, gender dimension of science and the intersectional uh, and intersectionality challenges of being in STEM 
and it's an exciting chapter that subsequently has appeared in every annual uh, World Science Report of UNESCO. Delighted to be here, excited to learn what the questions are, and looking forward to the panel. Thank you, Betsy. Thanks very much. Deb? Yep, thanks. It's Deb Schultz. Uh, it's always hard to follow Betsy because I don't, <laughs> don't really have any of those <laughs> special accolades. Um, I have a background in uh, mechanical and aerospace engineering. Unlike all the amazing people on this panel that are in the science, um, I set out to solve different problems. But anyway, I uh, ended up going into politics, uh, was an MP for King Vaughan for six years, uh, Minister of Seniors, and, um, and then my life took a turn. Uh, not that long ago, in 2019, I got diagnosed with follicular lymphoma and uh, have been battling that. And I guess we'll get into some of it on the panel, but I, I'm on a trial an immunotherapy trial that has been absolutely unbelievable. But when I saw the cost up there, what you talk about trials, I am recipient of about a million dollars of um, of funding that's putting me through the trial. It's not paid for by the government. It's paid for by Roche um, to show that their drug is effective. And it is. For me, it's been amazing. So I'm in uh, remission, which is yay, uh, getting life back on track. But unfortunately, I got diagnosed with breast cancer last year, invasive breast cancer that's already spread. So yeah, you know, the journey goes on. But um, very, very excited about this point in time when you, I was <laughs> crazy excited about the panelists and all the speakers. Um, but it's, we, I think everybody through history says they're at an exciting time of innovation, but I really believe that we are just cracking the code um, of how we're going to be able to help more people like myself and Betsy and others. And as has been said, almost all of you are touched in some way, cancer, heart disease, that sort of thing. So cracking the code and, uh, and helping uh, the organizations that are trying to do this kind of research and is what I'm in, involved in this for. Very honored to be being brought in. And uh, and it's the federal level, and I know how it works. Um, I've got obviously lots of contacts there. If there's some way that we can help you in that level, crack, um, crack some of those uh, codes and barriers that, that are stopping you from moving forward, that's what we want to try to do. Betsy's also extremely good, as you know, about telling stories. We know that the public needs to hear this story. They need to hear what's going on at OVC and in translational health. They don't have a clue generally, um, unless you know, you've know you somehow been brought into it like I have. So that's a huge opportunity for us to communicate this story, get buy-in, get supporters, get more money. <laughs> And, uh, and support all of you uh, in your ambitions to, to move this research and this uh, technology and this opportunity forward. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. We also have another panel member, uh, Trevor Shepard, who is, by the magic of technology, I believe he's going to appear on the screen at any moment. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, we hear you, Trevor. OK, if you don't see don't me, that's see fine. Yet. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I'm Trevor Shepard. I'm uh, down the highway at the London Regional Cancer Program, uh, translational oncology scientist, and I'm an associate professor in OBGYN oncology and anatomy and cell biology at Western University. Really sorry I couldn't join you there today. It just uh, wasn't going to work schedule-wise. I'm glad I can be part of the, the panel. So my area of research is in ovarian cancer. Uh, I've been here for a little over 15 years, and uh, as a translational oncology scientist, a lot of my work deals with uh, gaining access to patient-derived samples and being able to uh, develop translational models of ovarian cancer research to better understand the biology and the complexity of the disease using patient-derived samples. So obviously, I have experience working closely with the Ghanaian uh, surgeons and medical oncologists to be able to develop these living biobanks. And as well, this is expanded now to uh, three-dimensional patient-derived organoids and, and collaborating with groups at PMH and, and elsewhere. So hopefully I can bring sort of my elements and areas of expertise uh, to, to the panel and to the discussion. So I'm happy to, uh, to be a part of it. Thank you very much, Trevor. So now we're going to get into the actual questions themselves. And Michelle, I see you looking at me. You, I, I'm just presenting the questions that were given to me, but you're first on the list. 
<laughs> we, we, we talked a lot this morning about translational research at a fairly high level, uh, conceptual level. So I'd, I'd like you to tell the audience here, how does translational research impact on your day-to-day -day work as a clinician researcher in the OVC and how you see that moving forward in the future? Right. That's a great question. So, um, you know, I think one of the big things when I'm sort of looking at my daily practice and how I do things is, is really trying to look at it from the perspective of not just following the status quo of what have we always done, but instead really trying to consider, you know, what are the options and what can we do potentially do differently? And so I think that ultimately really dovetails well when we talk about translational research um, for multiple reasons. Some of it is advancing veterinary medicine because we're looking at, okay, here's what we do in vet medicine, but are they doing something differently on the human side that we could incorporate into our practice? So there's that translation in both directions. The other piece of it, though, is often, okay, maybe this is something they're doing on the human side, but they're doing it in a different area of specialty, or they're utilizing a certain technology, but they're not utilizing it in this way. Could we incorporate that into our clinical practice and then share that information and potentially improve it on the human side? Um, so a potential example of that is some work that Dr. James and I have done around 3D printing. So 3D printing um, is and especially in metal 3D printing is something that's growing quite a bit on the human side. But when you get into the patient-specific implants, um, it's still an area where it's fairly specialized in, in sort of a niche market. Um, and often what happens on the human side with any of this type of work is it can be really challenging to bypass a lot of the regulatory requirements to be allowed to actually evaluate some of these different tools. And so on the veterinary side, we have a little more flexibility around, um, you know, incorporating patients into this work and we can take those those things like those patient specific implants we can evaluate those in our patients um, and then we can kind of follow that that course of action and so again that back and forth translation of information um, which then you know is looking at benefiting our patients it's benefiting human patients it's potentially opening up commercialization opportunities and and opportunities to work in those spaces as well um, and so that's a big piece of sort of everything we do um, around that. Um, another example is around data, and um, Scott's going to speak much more to this um, as well. But we have a wealth of information at our fingertips that will allow us to again, modify how we approach a patient based on the information that we have in front of us that we don't even know exists. And so being able to utilize tools such as artificial intelligence to look at a patient profile and make decisions on how we approach those patients. Um, again, on the veterinary side, allows me to potentially have a more personalized approach to my patient care on the veterinary side, but it then also can inform me of you know, how are those similarities existing? So similar to Jeff's talk this morning um, around the cancer side of things and how similar we have these different aspects of, of the, the genome and different components of how we approach these patients, we can continue to kind of modify that. Um, and a lot of these things are very small changes that we can easily implement in a clinical setting tomorrow. So I can take that information and it still exists in a realm that I don't necessarily have to go through years of proof of concept. I can implement some of that information in the short term, um, which is the other piece that I find really exciting is it's, you know, very actionable in a very short period of time as well. Um, I think the final piece of that is just technology. So Technology from an um, actual physical medical to a perspective is, is constantly evolving and changing. Um, and again, on the human side, often you can only use technology around the specific regulatory piece that it's been approved for. Um, so for example, I do a lot of near-infrared fluorescence imaging. And um, in general, the fluorophores or the actual tool that we inject or the dye that we inject um, typically there's only one dye that's kind of approved from a regulatory perspective. And so it's approved from a regulatory perspective with very specific criteria. Um, and I can translate that by taking the information they've done on the human side saying, oh, well, if it works here, maybe we can apply it over here, evaluate that. And then again, we can, we can sort of share that information and then refine it um, and continue to move forward and then start moving into patient specific work. So, you know, having graduate students who are working on 
fluorophores that are specific to cancer um, targets rather than just having these more general tools. Um, again, utilizing our patient population makes my job better. Um, I get to play with cool technology. I have a better, as a surgeon, having a better defined target, um, knowing that what I'm doing is going to be potentially more beneficial to the patient is, is really exciting. But then also, you know, we can use that patient as a model to show in lung cancer, if it works really well in dog lung cancer, and we know that we're targeting something that's also existing in human lung cancer, we can take that information and then move it forward. Can I, yeah, can I yes, go ahead, Scott. Yeah. Yes. I actually have another example that we did in, this is in clinical practice, not in academic or research. So we uh, at Animal Health Partners adopted a machine vision surgical platform for spinal surgeries. It's a human system that we brought in because we felt it would be beneficial to our populations as well. So we utilized, it was cleared for FDA use in adult humans uh, for spinal stabilization surgeries. But what we did was we brought it into our populations, obviously our smaller anatomy uh, to the to the adult uh, human spinal surgeries. So, but through the utilization of in our population, they were able to adapt their machine algorithms, their their machine learning algorithms associated with machine vision, and that what that enabled was then the utilization for them to use it for pediatric patients in humans. So you get this. I call. I mean, I call it like a like a, a cycle or or a uh, some form of a current that goes around. But you start with the human in intervention. You bring it into our environment. We can improve upon it within the permitted framework uh, in a new challenging environment that improves the technology better and then translates it further to more more better well advanced and and expand utilization in humans. And I think that's the constant cycle that can continue to occur. And at that top of that cycle can either be human or veterinary. And it, it, the same cycle applies. It doesn't have to be a human intervention to start. It could be a veterinary intervention that goes through that same cycle. Thank, thank you, Scott. Tre Trevor, can I bring you in and perhaps do you have a, a, a similar sort of um, tale of how you have been involved in translational research and how you develop that? Yeah, so that's great. I just raised my hand. I don't know if you saw that because I just wanted to add to that. I, oh, I had made yeah, a now note. Now I do see it. Yes, thank yeah, you. So, uh, yeah, nice segue. So I made a note as Michelle was talking there about this idea, of, you know, a definition of translational research is, and I think what, what your program has the capacity to do is that sort of iterative process, right? And, and Scott spoke to that uh, directly, this idea that, you know, being able to go back and forth in a very efficient way and be able to, to use what you learn in, in one system in, in animal veterinary care and applications uh, with human patients and vice versa. And, and the more you show examples of that, I think the more it'll be uh, adopted in, in other areas too. So my question maybe to Michelle was, um, you know, are there examples where, and, and maybe Scott, you were actually talking about this as an example, uh, good ones where, there have been new technologies that have been implemented in, in veterinary practice that help to accelerate the uh, adoption uh, into human clinical practice in terms of approval and regulations. Because you talked about that's sort of an advantage of veterinary care is maybe you don't have as many regulations and you can actually explore these, these new ideas and new technologies a little bit easier. But have you had examples of where you've done that and now it's actually allowed uh, the expansion of a new technology in human patients? So we do have a couple, um, you know, I think one excellent example was some work that was done a few years ago with Dr. Woods, who I think is still here, um, around um, a vaccine for mammary cancer. And so I think that's a, a great example of a vaccine in cats. So cats, um, mammary cancer is very similar to, to invasive human mammary cancer. And so um, that was able to really accelerate the process of uh, approval and move in, moving into the clinical trial space. Um, another one that we're working on currently is with the University Health Network. Um, is a It's an imaging agent called Porphosomes. Um, and it's an imaging agent, multimodal imaging is really only one component of it. And ultimately um, will hopefully be a, a component that we can utilize with drug delivery as well as um, multiple other functions. Um, but we're working really closely with them right now this is something that they've developed over, you know, several years, and we were able to to move that into clinical trials in our space. Um, there's there's really subtle things that you don't think about 
uh, when you're trying to develop a clinical trial, if you're not in that space, like how do you handle the actual agent or what's the best timing for the dosing? And, you know, what are side effects that maybe didn't show up in your lab environment? And so we've been able to inform them um, on some of those levels just with the initial work that we've been doing. We're in pretty early stages there. So we have another clinical trial starting shortly with cats as well that will take things even further. Um, but I think it's been really helpful, even just from a logistical perspective. Um, we're, we're involved in their Health Canada application. So the goal is, and the thought is that it's probably going to ultimately help to accelerate and move it into a more effective, um, you know, phase one, phase two, more phase two side of things, because they're not having to do all that troubleshooting in the human side. We can deal with a lot of that. So then they're going to pick the best course of action more quickly and hopefully um, be more efficient with it. Yeah, Michelle, absolutely. Building, building. I, I agree with that. I, I think what that does is it, it really addresses this translational gap, right? It's it's not just the acceleration, but it's actually knowing what may be those hurdles earlier rather than later. Yeah. Michelle, building on that a little bit, um, and I'm thinking particularly of surgical procedures in human pediatrics. You know, the MD surgeon can learn to do the technique and the art and the anatomy on animal models. Mm -hmm. But when you're faced with real disease, it's not the same. Absolutely. So how do you think we can benefit human pediatric surgeons by your experience in, you know, cats and small dogs, which are so similar to human pediatrics? Yeah, I think it's a great question. So, I mean, babies are not just small people, um, just like, you know, cats are not small dogs either. Um, there is a lot of variations there. And um, and even just in terms of how we handle dosing, um, all of those sides of things from a technique perspective, absolutely, there's going to be a lot of refinement of technique. Um, you know, not having med medical school on site, we don't tend to work with them one-on-one um, -on -one in those types of environments, but certainly there are opportunities for us to, to be looking at some of these cases that are complex where we could be collaborating um, quite closely. So, you know, knowing that there is potentially a, a, a parallel pediatric um, condition that we want to study, then we do have opportunities to, to have those human surgeons come and join us and, and be involved in those case procedures as well. Um, you know, in veterinary medicine, we often we don't necessarily get to the similar complexity um, with the way that we approach certain surgical techniques. Uh, you know, you don't see me in surgery for 24 or 48 hours like they sometimes will with some of these pretty um, complex human procedures. Um, but certainly that doesn't mean that there's not a lot to learn and understand in terms of just environment and interaction and things as well. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. Moving along the panel, Sarah, what, what are your experiences in terms of transla translational research and clinical applications? So I think my is working good. The best example that comes to mind is some work that I had done with Dr. Thomas Koch, who is an associate professor in the Department of Biomedical Sciences. Um, and he's also founder of the of a veterinary stem cell company that focuses on manufacturing stem cells for veterinarians. So we took um, mesenchymal stem cells, which uh, Matt Vicarious talked about a variation of earlier today, and we were able to do tissue engineering um, with these cells. We took them from horses, from, from umbilical cord blood, and used them to generate cartilage tissue that was integrated with a bone substitute. So we actually took this technology, and kind of going back to your iterative process from human to animal back to human, we took our methodology from sheep. Um, it was a paper published through a colleague that does work in human medicine, but actually had, had done a lot of this, this tissue engineering work with sheep cells. We translated the technology to equine cells and have found this, this group also took what we learned and has done it with human cells as well. So we do see this iterative process with regards to taking lessons learned from one species, applying it to another, and then applying it back to the human side of things. The benefit of this technology is these tissue engineered constructs that have cartilage and bone. The idea here is they can be used to treat osteochondral defects. So in instances, especially in horses who can very commonly get um, either full thickness cartilage defects or partial thickness cartilage defects, is we can potentially surgically repair them with a tissue engineered construct without requiring the need for any um, cadaver grafts or, or, or autographs or anything like that, and potentially apply the same technique in humans with the idea that cartilage, which is not a very regenerative tissue, um, that we could potentially repair it before it becomes um, 
full-blown osteoarthritis. That's the biggest example that, that I can think of currently for that translational piece. But I wanted to talk a little bit about going back to that training aspect. Um, because we have so much going on in the OVC with respect to how we train our DVM students and our graduate students. And one fantastic example of that that is so translational is the IVF program, is we can train our graduate students, we do it quite well on how to, um, how to fertilize bovine oocytes. And a lot of those graduate students go on and they're then working in human IVF clinics. There's a lot of translational training that I see being so imperative and important to building and filling that talent gap that we speak of so frequently um, in our space, in the veterinary space, as well as in the human space too. So there's a lot of capacity there, I think, uh, for training too. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to push in an, an additional question. I'm going off script, which is fine. I, li I like doing that. And I'm focusing this particularly at Trevor and Michelle, but I think also to a degree to Scott and Sarah. You're all working in translational research. And that involves collaboration. I sense uh, there's a lot of faces in the audience I don't recognize and a lot of young people. So I sense there's a lot of graduate students in the audience, or at least a number of them. How do you develop those collaborations, which are so important to uh, both advancing your own career, but advancing the state of knowledge in terms of moving us forward in our ability to treat and hopefully cure disease? So any, anybody can go first, whoever would like to go. Scott, you look like you're ready to go. Well, well I don't know if I'm going to talk about a problem or a solution, but um, you know, I think one important aspect of collaboration is the openness to collaborate and opening up your institution to knowledge from outside your institution. So, um, and that means uh, uh, having a means and a mechanism to share knowledge and share data and information, um, but as well to have an ability to Move, move knowledge from outsiders to inside your college and have a, an ability to interact in a, I'll, I'll use the term free market capacity, um, in order to then bring things to market faster. I think, you know, that success breeds success. So if you create an environment in which you have that free flow of interchange of knowledge uh, and information, and it isn't intervening with too much red tape, it will open up the ability. I've worked in other countries before, where you have a very uh, fluid operation between research institutions and clinical institutions. And it's a very free flowing and very innovative environment that creates incredible uh, outcomes for, for patient outcomes. So creating that is, is a culture change. Um, so I'd say it's a problem. It's more of a problem in Canada than other countries, to be honest. Um, but the solution is effectively creating more open channels and a means to which to be more open to innovative concepts. Thank you. Trevor? Yeah, if I could just jump in there, because uh, you hit the nail on the head there, Scott, and I think it's that just recognizing that if you really see that collaboration is going to drive your research and just the overall uh, you know, research direction in your particular field, is recognizing there will be that activation energy that you have to overcome to do that. And it means you know ha putting that extra work in at the beginning to facilitate and to nurture those collaborations. And once you get them going once you get that free flow of information and you have projects that are working and you see the outcomes of those early collaborations it will continue to go but it's tough at the beginning so Michelle, it's, it's do you have not anything an, to an add? over so oh sorry no sorry trevor i cut you off we're good no i would agree i think that um from a collaboration perspective I think a key component too is is involving, trying as much as possible to involve graduate students at, at all the different levels of those conversations as well. Um, helping them to understand what goes into developing a collaboration uh, rather than sort of just having them do the work in the lab, but actually giving them the opportunity to um, participate in events like this and higher level events so that they really truly understand um, all that's going on. I think sometimes, I mean, our grad students look at us and, and we're in meetings all the time and they're kind of like, what do they do all day? <laughs> we're here doing all the work and they just like read a paper every once in a while and put a bunch of red ink on it and that's all they, so I think, you know, really helping helping um, everyone to understand sort of what the process is all the way through um, can be very helpful. 
And then also it, along with that is just sort of fostering that innovation when you see it come along. So, you know, I've been really fortunate to work with some incredible students who are much smarter than I am and, and they come up with these amazing ideas. And instead of sort of saying, well, but our funding covers this and this is what you were hired for, being able to sort of pivot and say, look, that's really cool. Um, let's see how we can develop that. Um, let's see how we can answer some of those questions and sort of use the talent and the the knowledge that they have, um, because sometimes you can have really cool things come from that that are much beyond what you would have expected in that environment as well. So, you know, my whole program is based on collaboration. Um, you know, I'm one small piece of a huge puzzle. Um, I have some surgical skills that, you know, are probably things that lots of other people could do as well. Um, you know, it's not me as the individual who is an important piece of, you know, it's not that any one person is necessarily the key to to success. Um, it's that group together and finding that you can collaborate with people um, that have a similar vision is really key. And not trying to force collaborations, I guess, would be the other piece. Um, you know, I think early in my career, I, I often sort of had a more targeted view of how to collaborate um, and was trying to approach people based on sort of their profile and what I thought, how I thought they fit into the program that I wanted to see. Um, and realizing that actually the collaborations that happen more naturally based on people who have probably a similar interest, but not necessarily always the exact same direction um, has been really the ones that have been most successful because a lot of times it does come down more to personality and um, and how you work with people rather than their exact expertise. Um, and again, that opens the door for things to go in a different direction. Um, you know, it can seem sometimes seem unfocused, but at the end of the day, it also really gives you an opportunity to to kind of explore things you wouldn't have expected. Thank you. Scott, you raised a really interesting point there about the openness of and sharing of information. I primarily work in industry and you live and die on confidentiality. Yeah. And ju just to give you an example, one of my primary focuses in my day job is intrathecal drug administration, active area of research. And I was invited to give a seminar on the state of the art by one of our sponsors, which I did. I get an hour long presentation and half an hour discussion. I illustrated my presentation with data from their work and the small amount that was published. At Invicra, we've done about 300 studies in this area, and we've probably got about three or four publications. So then another company invites me to give the same seminar. It, you know, it seems to be well received, but I've got to redo it to illustrate it with data from their research because I can't share the other stuff. And a lot of it comes down to my synthesis of the research that's being done. And this is what I think, but I can't give you any of the data to support that. So a lot of it is done on trust. And I think that's one of the challenges of working with industry because they are there to develop a product that they can sell and make a profit from, and they don't want their competitors to know about it. And I think that's a big challenge for a university to be able to maintain that confidentiality and be able to keep the relationship going um, as we move forward. So it really can be very challenging. Well, Scott, you look like you have a, a response. Well, I think it's more about governance, right? So in, an, in a university environment, you have governance policies around the ability to share information and data, whether you have agreements that specifically limit the, 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 the transmission of information across channels or whether it's an openness to sharing data. Because if you don't have an openness to sharing data, you're not going to get collaborations. Yeah. So it's a, like, you know, you live or die by your information, whether you share it or you don't share it. So, you know, you've got this double-edged sword. The fact of the matter is, though, there are levels of information you can always share. You know, and, and, it's, and to your point about synthesis, it's about parsing the data in such a way that you can share it to the general audience and then repurposing it into the individual frameworks in which you can apply it. And, you know, for you to do it that man as a manual process, I can imagine time consuming and extremely difficult. So having appropriate technologies to parse and summarize and aggregate and analyze data, that's probably the key to being able to share information effectively. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Betsy and Deb, I haven't forgotten about you. 
I'm, I'm going <laughs> to ask for questions from the audience, and then you're right in the line of line of fire is too strong a word, but you're 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 the next up for some questions. So, anybody from the audience got any questions who want to ask the panel on what we've discussed? Jim. Yeah, the, I'd just like to echo the the importance of collaboration. And, you know, I think I've collaborated with most of the people in the room here, to be honest, around a very collaborative program. But the, the part of the problem with with developing a collaborative research program is you, you don't know what you don't know. And, and I've heard from many people in this room today that many of us exist at the same institution. And the unifying theme was we had no idea that this work was going on. So the, the question is, well, how, how are you going to, establish a collaborative research program when we're somewhat disconnected. And so I think one of the one of the things that we need to identify is the mechanism by which we can learn about what complementary and, and collaborative opportunities might exist. Um, and not just here, you know, we don't even know what's going on in our own, own institution at a, at a great level of depth. So so how do we how do we find Especially when we're transcending, you know, I'm a basic scientist and and you know working with some veterinary oncologists, but now to make that that next leap to work with with human clinical scientists, clinician scientists, that that's a whole other void that where we have very limited um, knowledge about some of the collaborative opportunities. So I think that one of the really big barriers we need to figure out how to get past is is getting a mechanism where we can learn where some of those really productive collaborations lie and and how can it how to connect and and so i you know i don't know i don't have any answers to these questions but i think that that's a really important thing as 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 our research programs are evolving and, and we want to develop this translational um research enterprise how do we find the people Thanks, so Jim. one of this really jim to answer your question like this is one of the ways to do that, right? So symposia, we know conferences are wonderful for networking, but I did want to point out, I have been in academia for, I think I was like technically 10 years and then in industry for one. So what I have learned in my one year is how collaborative we are within industry. Then I mean within my company, but I have collaborated on projects with so many different kinds of people so that includes scientists, which is more my, my people that I know our languages line up. But it also includes business development, included finance, IT, all these individuals that if you had told me like a year and a half ago that I would be working on an IT project with a bunch of people from finance and supply chain, I would be like, what, what does that even mean? I'm, I'm not sure. But what I have learned from that is you can collaborate and the collaborations that we build really, really depend on the fit with the person and they depend on really a shared vision of the end goal of that product or project. So I think that opportunities such as this, where we really start to learn that there are all of these people who have a similar idea in mind. We all want this institute to be successful. We all want the world to really understand how companion animal medicine, translational medicine really will be key in moving our human health forward and vice versa. But I also think it's super important for us all to really understand that these collaborations are so much more than just, I'm a cancer researcher, you're a cancer researcher, let's be friends. It's it's a lot more than that. And I've seen it a lot in my field of regenerative medicine because we touch so many things. Like we touch neuro, we touch cardiology, we touch kidneys, we touch everything. And it's just, it's been a really fantastic learning opportunity so far in industry to really see how that can explode even further than just the research itself. So I think that's kind of an important point I wanted to make as well. Thank you. Deb. Yeah, thank you. When I was listening to Jim, I was thinking, yes, this symposium, and I think I mentioned it to Jim as well, or somebody, we should do these on a regular basis, like every six months. But what I want, when as you were talking, I'm thinking there's social media networks that you could build that would help you be able to post the kind of work that you're doing within your network so you could control who had it. So that was kicking through my head. But when you were talking, I was thinking, what is it in your company that is allowing that to happen? And that's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> Not your vision, but your tool. 
corporate. Um, (laughs) (laughs) It's a lot of, you know what I think it is? Milestone driven, key performance indicators, things that make me want to go, but they're really important. And it's, it is, you're right. It's a metric driven organization. It is, like I said, it's a corporation and this company serves customers. So in this case, they are taking fee for service customers, what we call them, and they are working towards specific deadlines, meeting timelines in order for uh, specific things to get manufactured or for technology to be translated. And we reach these milestones. So I think we can apply some of that to our translational research as well and take a lot of the learnings that come from this space into that as well. So, and we have so many meetings, I can't even tell you how many meetings we have. It is more than I've ever experienced, but these meetings are very, very, very regimented and they have very specific out- agendas and outcomes. So I think the, the, I guess what I'm trying to say is there's, a, there's, I see a lot of efficiency. And so it allows you to then identify individuals that you can then collaborate with on a project. Does that, does that help answer your question? It's kind of how we work it. Yeah, just to finish off uh, with my thoughts, um, I come from Bombardier Airspace, used to be de Havilland. Uh, We build aircraft. Um, They're very collaborative, in fact, and you have companies all over the world that are contributing to pieces of that airplane. They all have to come together and they have to work as one. And they are very strongly driven or like structures at how to get people to work together, make sure the pieces all come together. So that's what I was hoping to drive out from that question to you is what are the mechanisms that you're using to do that? But uh, yeah, they're powerful. Thank you. I think Michelle. from an academic perspective, I think we have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. I think as academics, we live in our little bubble and we're okay with not knowing the answer to a scientific question. But as soon as you push us to try and do something that's like completely outside of that academic question, we get really uncomfortable. And so I think that's part of it too is, and I, I to be honest, I don't know that the university environment necessarily always is that supportive either. We're kind of expected to just like figure it out. What do we need to do to accomplish this? What do we need to do to accomplish that? Like we're sort of put in a situation where we don't necessarily have the support sometimes that we need to answer some of those questions. We don't have that resource of somebody that we could walk down the hall and say, hey, I need to accomplish this. Walk me through what that looks like. And so it's finding those resources and collaborations. But again, it's 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 trying to collaborate with people outside of your bubble um, and being uncomfortable with the fact that you know you're not going to understand most of what they say and you're going to contribute a piece of that puzzle but you're not necessarily going to be able to answer all of those questions. It's not going to be like someone comes to you and you can answer everything about that question. You're going to have to say, well, this is the piece that I understand and here's the knowledge I can contribute, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on in the background that is gibberish. Um, And I think as academics, that's really uncomfortable because we're used to having, you, you know, you do your literature review, you learn about that that industry, that aspect of what you need to know, and then you're the expert. Um, And so it is really hard when you get pushed outside of that. If I can build on that a little bit, particularly what Sarah said, and to a degree what Michelle said, the advantage of working in a big company of about 500 people is that if I have an MRI physics question, I know I've got several of them available. Same with um, nuclear imaging, same with image analysis questions. And before I joined industry, you know, I'd be working on image analysis and it would take me days to work out the script to do whatever I wanted to do, or I'd have to hire somebody in it. Then it took months. Now I ask to have this done and it's done in half a day. And then the other point about working in industry, we have these regular meetings several a week in the different sections where we go through the list of new projects or new opportunities, as we call them, where a company has approached us, they want us to do something. And that's where you bring in the knowledge of, you know, the molecular biologist who has some perspective that I would never have thought of. And you move forward by, okay, you two go and talk and move this forward. And I think that's one of the advantages of working in industry. And Universities, I think, can do this as well. I I think it's just more difficult because you don't have the formal structure where you have those regular weekly meetings or however frequent they are to be able to move that collaboration forward. More questions from the audience? Yes, Laurent.
in academia every two to four years, there's a complete turnover of the people that are actually doing the work that we're trying to do. Whereas in industry, you have that longevity and you're not necessarily, well, sometimes, and your goal isn't really to train, but you're not constantly losing a skill set or a knowledge base and having to rebuild it again and go on and, and so forth. So I'm wondering if you could perhaps comment on that and how, I don't know if that's a barrier or an opportunity, however you would frame that, um, how we can perhaps manage that in the context of conducting translational health research. I mean, I'll 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 speak I'll, yeah. I'll I'll speak from a like a company owner and founder perspective and building a company and you always have to have redundancies to allow for that right you always have turnover and you have to have continuity regardless of whether or not you have turnover um, and your objectives don't change you have to keep your milestone driven objectives in your front of mind so you have to have some redundancies in place to allow for HQP to allow for turnover and all those those elements I think the same thing here and i imagine with cohorts you have the ability to create some degree of redundancies and and development uh, of personnel so that you can create continuity it's not just i guess maybe with faculty as that faculty goes you lose a brain trust uh, and that becomes difficult so I, I hear that but maybe it means that within interfaculty there has to be a little bit more continuity even within a faculty to ensure that the project has continuity. There's more than one PI on any project, you know, to ensure that continuity. Thank you. Be Betsy or Deb, I thought one of you had a comment. You want me to go? Yeah. I'll go, only because this is a question that I get asked every day. So um, CRM is, has a subsidiary called Omnia Bio. Omnia Bio will be hiring hundreds of people and I'm like looking at everybody who might need a job in a few years, hiring hundreds of people and therefore the training program needs to be well established for that. We anticipate a specific percentage of turnover based on the industry average. And that turnover can be yearly. And so you need to have systems built so that there is redundancy. So the way that we look at it is build particular programs that sit almost like a regular curriculum that anybody could with enough experience can kind of come in and, and essentially teach. So if I'm, for example, I taught like biomedical physiology for the first time last year and I was given all the slides, I was given the curriculum, I was given structures of the questions. So I had that structure and I walked in and it did work, of course, to train myself, learn the stuff, teach the class. But the structure was there. And so that redundancy had been has been built in for however 20 years that course has been taught. But I think with respect to your question about how it relates to translational medicine is to your point about having faculty collaborations, but also really, really identifying that, that research. And this goes for anything really, that that research can continue when the people that are responsible for making the data leave by having systems in place that may be really, really, really good SOPs, good documentation practices, um, and or collaboration with industry where you can start to build pipelines for products or technologies that will then sit and have that really, really robust documentation that somebody who's coming in who's new can really just kind of pick up and take off. So I think like it's so important to have, again, going back to collaboration, but having those different minds involved in that because someone from industry will say, well, absolutely, you got to document everything. It's really, really important because it's it relates to training. It relates to turnover. It relates to just being able to keep a program going when your graduate students or your favorite postdoc leaves. It's really, really, really important. It's a really good question. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. But, but I'm, I'm now going to Betsy and Deb for your, your questions. And I'm basically asking you both the same question. I'd like to hear each of your perspectives on how being a patient impacts your perspective of translational research. And how do you think we can improve translational research and close that gap from your perspective of, as a patient? So. E either of you, you know, either order, both, both, both of you. I'll start this one, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, wow. Well, obviously, when you are touched by cancer, but again, most of us are, right, through a family member or a friend. Um, it's a motivation to be able to make sure that those people survive and that they are here with us and that 
that I'm still around and Betsy's still around. It's a motivation that's personal, but it's also for everyone. Like I, I grieve the loss of, of colleagues that have died and I feel died unnecessarily because they just missed the window of when a treatment was coming through the pipeline. So if we can speed up the pipeline and I can be of any help to speed up that pipeline, Cost is astronomical and cost affects, I mean, not so much, in, well, it is in Canada to a certain extent because it does affect how our provinces, you know, approve things and who gets it and, you know, that it's not supposed to, but it does. Um, in the States, it's catastrophic for, for people. So, you know, if we can reduce the cost of bringing these things to market uh, and make them more effective through the circular back and forth discussion and Jim has made this really clear to me as I've worked with him now for the last six months, it's getting the feedback from the patients as well. And I'm seeing that through my work through the trial. They're very much interested in what we have to say about what we're experiencing, what are the side effects, all this is feedback. You know, they're trying, you know, different ways of infusing, you know, intravenous injections, pills, you know, what is, what is happening with internally with us? So I think, we're a powerful proponent. We're obviously motivated. Um, and I think with the right stories told and the right information, we can get a population that really gets on board with this. And so that's that's my motivation. Um, and it's a bigger, broader, it's not just for me, it's for, for humanity. I think we're, we're, um, we're on the cusp of something here and anything I can do to help move it along, and that's what I'm here for. <laughs> Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Deb, Betsy. Well, I'm looking out and what I see is a powerful wave of the future leaders that will move this field and make it happen. So I'm going to speak about a different kind of translational gap. And that is the gap of explaining in an elevator ride with a minister exactly what all this mumbo jumbo is and all these dense uh, slides with information, the vocabulary we're accustomed accustomed to, but I want to challenge you to get very granular. You're the storytellers. You equip us to be able to say, here's someone seeking the scholarship, but she's in a PhD program and it doesn't fit with the publications when she's applying for more than a one year. You know your story and your story equips us to tell very powerful narratives that make it tangible and doable. So Deb and I are here to challenge you to also, uh, through Jim and um, the Institute, to write to us, uh, email us, and give us very granular narratives, storytellings, examples, and very specifically what you need. So here are three lenses I'd like you to think about putting at the edge of all that you do. And one lens is congratulations to University of Guelph being the first university in our nation to offer a degree in One Health. Spectacular. Congratulations, Dr. Charlotte Yates and the university. This is a collision of the three, obviously, interrelated fields of environment, animal, and human health. So as you do your work, uh, think about consciously, intentionally, how is the work that I'm doing incorporating that triangulation of intersections. That's one lens to put on. Another lens that I'd like to challenge you with is the ethics lens. And interestingly, when you tell the story of translational health and the innovation excitement we feel in this room, frequently the question comes up, but you're using animals. And there is the gap that is it ethical. Uh, there is that gap that uh, doesn't, uh, explicitly state the animals are presenting spontaneously in an environment that is shared and in a um, close relationship pathologically, histologically, and uh, treatment-wise with humans. So to think about the ethics, I had the chance at the Beth Israel Hospital at Harvard Medical School of going to uh, meet Dolly the sheep. She was still alive at that stage. And the question wasn't, could we do it? It was, should we do it? So think about the work you're doing. Is there an ethical lens there in any aspect that you are doing? Sourcing the materials you're using in the laboratory, you know, collaborations around the world, 
you know, the human justice, the equity, all of the ethical issues, and challenge yourself, not only in your field here in the Institute, but eventually perhaps industry. And so that's a second lens I would put on, not only the One Health lens, but the lens of ethics. And the third is the leaky pipeline, as was described in the UNESCO um, inaugural chapter on gender and intersectionality. In the leaky pipeline, who is leaking out? In looking at this participation forum today, are there missing faces, missing voices? Uh, could you think of collaborations that would, or environments, or a physical do a, a checklist, um, a gender checklist? Uh, this is a well-known equipment out of. Um, uh, women uh, at the United Nations organization, which just has a checklist of how well lit is the parking lot and the infrastructure for feeling safe, no matter what your race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, just to be conscious of that leaky pipeline. Am I a part of that? Am I able to feel comfortable? And if not, then that's one of the little micro inequities that wear you down over time and we may lose you. And all I can see, Deb, I don't know about you, but this engine out there have powerful <laughs> stories of, uh, that know why it's difficult to get the money or the food security or the housing that we need to hear to equip us. And then, of course, uh, as Canadians, another lens, and it's a gift to us, is the Royal Commission uh, that looked at our First Nation and Aboriginal persons. They did not table a set of recommendations. They do not call it recommendations. They don't want it to be referred to that. It is calls to action. And you can sub-search that set of over 90 calls to action under education, under research, and see it pop up and say, could I, in my little environment, pluck a few of those recommendations using the lens of First Nations and Aboriginal persons to contribute? to a more peaceful and equitable nation inside the Institute and be a model. So I'm hurtling back out to this energetic crowd here. Not only that we meet more frequently, but that your stories become our stories and our stories get to the people who can perhaps help make those decisions uh, more, easily, um, uh, uh, more easily made because the story is tangible and understandable the lens of One Health, the lens of the pipeline and gender and intersectionality of first persons and the gender of ethics. Over to you, and I can't wait to hear some of those stories popping out in this. Jump up, tell a quick story, and if it doesn't get told on that camera over there, which I hope it does, then email us and, and we'd be delighted to equip and empower you to do what you most love and want to do. Thank you. Any members of the panel want to uh, build on that, ask a question of Deb or Betsy before we go to the audience for questions? I think we're incredibly privileged to have both of you here today willing to share your experiences. And I see Trevor with his hand up. Yeah, I just really wanted to echo uh, the comments that were made there. And I think that the key thing, especially as a basic scientist who mentors trainees in a cancer research laboratory, that works in translational research is giving your trainees, your graduate students, your postdocs, the opportunities to interact directly with clinicians, as well as with patient partners in research, uh, ones that want to uh, learn about what we do. And just that element of knowledge translation, there's many different ways to think of knowledge translation, and, and this is a critical one. So I just wanted to echo that. And, and you know, as a scientist or as a PI, a researcher, to give your trainees those uh, opportunities. It might be definitely stepping out of their comfort zone, but if you do that, it will be very worthwhile, not only for your program, but also for their uh, training as well. Thank you, Trevor. Anyone else? Yeah, Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing to really add other than definitely have more patient presentations. It has been an absolute privilege sitting next to both of you today and hearing your stories. Like it's, it's so, inspirational to the work that we're doing here and i think that i gain inspiration from seeing you know our animal patients as well of course that's it's wonderful but hearing the human side of things um is incredibly motivating and i think that a lot of us get 
down, especially when you're like halfway through grad school and you're like, why am I even doing this? What am I even doing after? But hearing these stories, like I know for me, when I get down and I hear these kinds of stories, it really, really pushes me. It re-motivates me. This is why I'm doing what I'm doing. This is why I'm in this field. This is why I'm so passionate about this project and, and what we're doing here. So I just wanted to say to the organizers for this symposium and any other events, get as many patients as you can. And I have one in mind that I can have who had a stem cell transplant for lymphoma. So I will let you know. But it's, yeah, please, please. Also, it brings me to tears to hear that. It's wonderful that we can lift your life as well because we couldn't admire more the work that you do. And as you're bent over your microscope or your <laughs> shareholder meeting, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> it's important. Those, those are harder than a microscope. <laughs> <laughs> Probably are. That we love you and we're your ally and we, we need you that way. But when it was explained to me that, uh, and to my son, that the uh, treatment for ovarian cancer that I was receiving intravenously is some 40 years old. You know, my son, being a former pro hockey player, said, Mom, I can't imagine playing hockey designed for, uh, with a stick designed 40 years ago. So how do we move that field? How do we lift up the people that care about it and are involved in it? And we want to do all that we can to make that happen for you. And mutually, we will grow, and we hope you will succeed even better so that our next treatments and next treatments uh, will keep improving. We need you. We love you, and we want to support you. Now, I want to hear, I know, but when, when can they tell a story? <laughs> okay, go for it, audience. Questions for Deb and uh, Betsy, including stories. Yes, someone must have one. Go for it. <laughs> because we and want to hear another your one challenges, right? right? We want to hear not like just the good stories. Yeah, I understand. We want to hear your challenges. What is it that is burying you from your success and ultimately our success? So I spoke with both of you over the lunch break about what was a struggle for me having finished vet school then applying for funding for grad school is because I don't have a master's degree and I'm starting a PhD program, I kind of fall in the gap where I don't really fit the requirements for either of the tri-agency funding. So I'm funded by a master's scholarship, which is only one year, even though I'm in a four-year program because I'm not competitive enough to compete with the other PhD students because I don't have any first author papers because I didn't do a master's degree and haven't had the chance to do that. So having an, like a third category of people with a medical background or have clinical experience that they can compete against other people with clinical experience and not get thrown in the whole pool of everybody who has more research experience would have been very helpful for me and a lot of the research that is going to require be required in this is going to be people with clinical experience and medical backgrounds. I see a hand up in the third row there. And just just to say, I took it, I took it down when you told me, and I'm like, you know, this is this is the kind of important feedback that we need to hear. What what gaps are there, and how what might we fill them so that we can get the right people, the right places, the right time. Someone in this row had the hand up. Yes. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm so grateful to be here today in the audience and listening to these amazing speakers. I am a University of Guelph student. I go to the OBC and uh, I just finished my phase one. So I just wanted to touch on a little struggle with my summer job. So this summer, after completing my first year of vet school, I was really excited to get into the field. And of course, all jobs are having their different benefits, pros and cons. In a comparison of how much we're earning as researchers, it's not comparable, sorry, it's not comparable to a clinic wage. I am very fortunate to be in the position I am to be in a room with all of you. I make $15 an hour, so that's minimum wage. And when I compare to my other students that are out in clinic, they're making at least $18 an hour. So it is a struggle to pay for housing and pay for groceries. I'm so grateful to be here in the research field because this is what I'm truly passionate about. But I do feel that 
I shouldn't be sacrificing my wage in order to pursue this and have a significant occupational satisfaction. I'm really glad that you raised that because one of the first comments that was brought to my attention when I asked the speaker, what, what, he, what did he say to us? He said, it, we're not paying our grad students enough, right? So, you know, that's what, you know, that's, so I think this is really important information that we're take, gonna take back, right? So, so that was obviously a very important element because it was the first one that was brought up. So thank you very much for reinforcing that. And we got to do better. I mean, there are a lot of challenges. I think you got market challenges that are significant. Inflation is obviously a major one now. Um, I think that given uh, your DVM now, or you're, yeah, so you're you're pursuing your DVM. When you have your DVM and you see kind of what's going on in the industry, the bigger challenge becomes the benefits or the the the, the personal gratification of academia versus industry, and that's the it's the lifestyle. And, um, sacrifices you make in industry, and but the wage benefits that you achieve as a result, it's a personal struggle. And I, I mean, I, I it's I don't think it's universal, um, but it's a personal struggle that every individual has to go through. Whether you're doing this as an ideological approach to benefiting on the research side, or you're doing this on a capital approach of benefiting yourself materially, and I think everybody has to go through that struggle. And I don't think it's a one answer for everybody but it's a personal introspection that I think everybody has to have what their approach to life is. And can I just talk, it's not just about researchers because I have been a politician for a while and you have that struggle as well, right? Because you can make a lot more in business than if you step out of business and end up um, running for office to try to serve in that capacity. So you're making sacrifices to try to serve a greater good if that's, you know, what you, your ambition is and what drives you, right? So, yeah, it isn't just, you know, hardcore scientists that are making sacrifices. There's a lot of sectors in in, in the world that is, you know, you have to choose, right? It's a highly subjective question. What's a greater good? Well, in, like in industry, in CCRM, I mean, that's a greater Here, good. have a mic. Right. I don't know if they can hear you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, in industry as well, I mean, you shouldn't ever feel that you're sacrificing the greater good for approaching an industry approach. And we always talk about industry being profit oriented, milestone oriented, driving forward. But that's that's the necessity of progress is competition. And, and that will drive forward the outcomes for patients as well, because patient outcomes will drive forward demand for product. And that's going to further if our if our realization is we're here for patient outcomes. There's no, in my opinion, it's not a sacrifice to go to industry if you're in if you're in academia. Again, it's a I think it's a subjective approach. I don't think there's any objective answer I can say or anyone can say. It's really up to the individual where they feel that they fit and where their contributions are maximized. I think just to go along with that, um, you know, our hope with an industry with a um, institute like this is that we can try and bridge that gap a little bit in working with industry. So that we can change, we can shift that culture. So you know, the challenge of academia obviously is that you know, where is our funding sources coming from? You know, as a surgeon, you know, I'm I'm probably taking a 50 to 75 percent pay cut to be in academia versus being in private practice um, conservatively. And so you know, there's there's motivating factors of why we're here, but can we find a way to bridge that gap through culture shift and you know, working with academic partners, but then also having industry partners who have the financial means to help support us. So, you know, extending it from your conversation around grad students, but even further to that, you know, how do we, how do we get out of this like bubble of, you know, just scrape by and do the absolute minimum that we can and, you know, have these unfunded positions because you're doing it out of the goodness of your heart, but finding ways to sort of bridge that gap and try and encourage um, that collaborative environment where collaboration isn't just within an academic environment, but bridges those different areas um, to try and help to, to create a sustainable program for everyone as well, rather than people sort of looking at it as you have to choose one or the other. Is there a way that we can try and bridge that? Yeah, and it, it, sorry, if I, yeah, if I can just uh, follow Michelle's comments there, because I think that's hitting the, the nail on the head. If you, if you have this gap, and it continues to exist or even broaden, uh, we will start losing this critical workforce that we see in academia because really it is, especially in Canada, it is graduate students 
who really drive a lot of this research in the lab, uh, laboratories as part of these collaborations and things like that as well. And, and I think we need to recognize it. Do we need to bring it to part? That's not going to be realistic. But I think we do have to address this because if that marginality grows, in the future, we will be losing more of that critical workforce uh, in an academic setting. And overall, our research productivity and innovation, as we talked about on this panel, you know, they really drive that. So we need to recognize that. And I think we need to pressure both government as well as own, our own institutions and be creative in terms of uh, collaborations with industry to help, you know, maybe cobble that together, support that sort of infrastructure so that we can build up a, a stronger and more supportive uh, graduate research uh, enterprise. I think also they're going to be in a, they're going to be innovation gains as well in terms of productivity. I mean, we see already in terms of these large language models and the utilization of data in a more effective way, computational biology, all of these things are going to um, less, we'll call it human resource requirements, so that those who are remaining in human resources are focused on, we'll call it the higher fu functioning uh, elements of those human resources. And I think that's going to be, I think, a betterment for everybody because it's going to reduce the, um, it's going to reduce the, called the lower level interactions and focus more on the higher level interactions and the skill development. Thank you. One last question from the audience before we move on. Um, hi, I hate to sound like a broken record, um, but I'd like to start off with me coming into this program. Um, it was very personally driven. I love the field that I'm in and I wouldn't change it for the world. Um, however, just again, speaking on the kind of financial side of this, um, my mom's side, they're indigenous. My dad's side was an immigrant. I'm doing this on my own. They don't have a lot of money. Um, and even though I really love what I'm doing, it's still really hard um, just in the financial setting to kind of find that drive for me. Um, I know I still have a lot more time to go. I just kind of started and I'm not in a special boat. I know a lot of other people are in the same situation as me. Um, but I think just looking at the financial setting somehow, um, just to kind of keep the drive going and the desire for academia and the research. Um, I think that's just a really important thing to look at in the future. Um, and I know possibly it's already being looked at, but yeah, just addressing that concern. I have loved hearing that answer. And I'm wondering whether the Institute uh, disaggregates data to some extent, who is in the program and what uh, racial, ethnic, um, uh, sexual orientation, immigration status, uh, age, uh, are involved and engaged and inspired by it, just to keep a baseline and to be conscious intentionally about recruitment and retention and promotion is important, just as important as keeping a side eye on the ethics of what we are doing or a side eye on our calls to action in our nation or a side eye on the uh, One Health collision of mutually reinforcing aspects. It's an exciting field, it's inspiring, and I really thank you for offering those comments and uh, every story is so equipping for us to take forward. So back to the moderator and thanks for the chance. Thank you. That was a w wonderful overview and tremendously, tremendous responses to the questions. Thank you. Sarah. Where does training fit into this? It's a nice step from where we've been, and uh, you know, I have a question on that, so the floor is yours. Training fit into everything. Training is everywhere. Absolutely. Everywhere, everywhere. So it's one of the most challenging parts of what I do, and the most exciting parts of what I do is building systems, like we talked about earlier with Lauren's question, building systems around training and how to keep graduate students motivated and engaged when they're going through the hardest times of their life. Um, I've been in your shoes and I can't even imagine what it's like right now in like 2023. It's not, not pleasant. So we have to build systems. In, we have to build systems to make sure that the training that we provide our graduate students and our, and our DVM students to a certain degree, especially the ones that are in the summer programs, that they have the right curriculum in place that they can stepwise increase their skill set and that they are exposed to more than just their research. 
symposia like this are really important. We send our graduate students to conferences. We have them attend various workshops and things like that. But it is so important to rub shoulders with industry that I can't imagine how I went through grad school with hardly doing it. It's just so important to get that level of exposure to different to different jobs, even if you intend on staying in academia, just understanding how things work. Like Scott and I talked about like how industry works and how we sort of define what an academic life is versus like an industry corporate life, you might say. And I think it's so important for all of us, and this, this is kind of should be baked into a structured training, is to have exposure to industry. That can look like co-op programs. That can look like internships. Um, these industry members that we, that the B2B Institute will, will and does partner with, we need to expand that and we need to show these industry players, particularly for my company, who is just like, we need to hire all these people. Where are we going to get all these people from? Well, if they're exposed to the, the this university, for example, in this institute, and they see the trainees that are coming through the program, they take some of those trainees, maybe we assign them to specific projects. They learn ways to build technologies from the industry point of view. So they're very innovative, very translational to, to clinical trials and commercial. So all of that to say is that within our training programs, as we are thinking about really structuring this for this translational institute is making sure we have placements for that and, and, and space for that type of work. What that means is that a four-year research program for a PhD likely has to account now for having some exposure to industry. Maybe that's a semester, maybe that's a year even working in a different type of setting. And that's just, it's, I think it's extremely important and we have to kind of start to just, just incorporate that as even more so that our students know what's out there, right? Like you guys got to know what's out there for jobs. It's incredibly important and we got to keep thinking about this as we build this institute and thinking about how the work that we do here in the research translates to our individual students getting jobs as well. Thank you. Deb. Yeah, I'm so. just listening to you and I'm thinking of engineering. That's yeah, my yeah. background and Waterloo and, and they took a four year program, made it a five year program and and put the students into um, industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and and there are students that, you know, really I've talked to that have gone through the program. They felt that it was absolutely super important for them to have that. So I guess it really depends on how the Institute wants to frame itself but uh it, that's a powerful program at waterloo and uh i think it's pretty sure it's waterloo mm -hmm. and uh so yeah i, I think that's a, a good way to go about it mm -hmm. but you need the time to be able to do it right? you need time and i'm speaking a bit ideally here but it's i think it's it's a way to i think we have to roll with the times a little bit and we have to understand the financial considerations of what our students are going through and making these partnerships with industry may be one small way to, to try and remedy that. It's it's not going to fix everything, but it's one way in which we can take a more like a bit of a creative approach to just incorporate that in a little bit more. And then a different angle on training, perhaps, but is the mentoring between levels of undergraduate and graduate. And here is Dr. Teresa Bernardo in the back row over there, who was one of my mentors. You're ahead of me and just encouraging and helping crack the path forward every step of the way. Very important to be teaching each other and moving each other. I was one of the earlier uh, persons who also went through OBC with um, uh, a child, a two-year-old, three-year-old, whose nanny would come at lunch to the old coffee shop I don't know if any of no, none of you yeah. will remember. Some of us remember. A muffin, <laughs> a muffin and coffee shop. And so that um, acceptability of paternal leave and maternal leave and the acceptability of the challenges of intersectionality and how to accommodate and appreciate and support those that aren't alike and those that need that space to follow their passion but be accepted for what they are and who they are without having to deny aspects or just uh, give up. So thank you to all my mentors and I hope and I trust, and Jim, you were saying already, there is uh, this adaption of, adoption of, uh, maybe adoption of uh, mentoring between levels and persons who, 
foster this next wave of innovation and impact in through the Institute's work. Thank you. Trevor, you have your hand up. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to uh, provide a couple of examples from our uh, center here in London. So years ago, uh, there was a CIHR strategic training program that was centered on cancer research and technology transfer. It was run by Jim Korpatnik, who is a former director of our cancer program here. And it was exactly that. It was a, a dedicated program, uh, brought students from across different departments who were uh, involved in different levels of cancer research, but it was to provide them with that um, education around industry and, and, and learning about different ways that they can go about cancer research now and in their own research as well as in the future. So there is that one example of actually having that sort of training program in place and, and what that would look like. Uh, the other thing too uh, that I wanted to, uh, let's see if I can remember now, uh, technology transfer, oh it's escaping me. There's a, another element of that sort of cross fertilization uh, that could be uh, useful as well. And I, I just can't remember. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. So we're beginning to come to the end of our allotted time for this um, panel. And I think we've had a tremendous discussion, covered a lot more than I thought we would, particularly the, shall we say, the social and cultural aspects of how do we pay graduate students? And I think, you know, there, there are ways that can be pursued. And I'm going to point some fingers in the room. You know, Deb, you're, you have political connections. Cheyenne, and I see Jeff Wichtel appeared at the back of the room. You know, we, we haven't forgotten you, Jeff. You know, the, um, the scope to do. And I, I recognize it's not you go and knock on the door and you come back with a big suitcase of money. It's a long-term <laughs> proposition to change the funding model so that we are better able to look after our graduate students who are indeed our future. And I think, you know, aside from that, we've had a tremendous discussion. We've brought in both the academic aspects and Scott and Sarah have really brought out some of the perspectives of industry, which I don't think people in academia always have a really good perception of what it is and how we cross that bridge. And I think Think, and I don't just think, I hope we've met, taken some steps towards crossing that bridge today in a discussion and that the Bench to Bedside Institute can move this forward as we start to develop collaborations with industry. And I, my personal view is there's huge potential for those collaborations to move, move forward so that the end result is we have better treatment options for both our human patients and our veterinary patients. So I want to particularly thank the panel for giving up their time to be on the panel today. And I hope I didn't um, blindside you with any of my, my questions. <laughs> so uh, I think I'd like to invite the audience to show their appreciation for the panel and what they've done today. And I also want to thank um, Cheyenne, Jim, and Michelle for organizing this event today. Jim, do you want to have, have some closing words? And then we'll finish right on time. Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, yeah, I'd like to close once again to add my thanks to the, to the panelists. Uh, I think it was a, a fantastic discussion. One thing that I'm really excited about today was the level of interaction and, and discussion that we had. It's, as we put this together, this was our hope that we were going to stimulate discussion and, and really have a free flow of information. Because as, as organizers of the event, you, you know, we, we're not coming here with all the answers. Part of, part of our goal today was to find out what the greater community's hopes were for the Institute and, and, and how the Institute can evolve to, to maximize its impact for all, all of our researchers, both here at, at Guelph and, you know, at Western and, and at lots of our other potential collaborative centers. So we're really happy that that happened. Uh, I feel that there's a great sense that, that there's a lot of engagement, a lot of enthusiasm and some great ideas that came forward that are really going to help us craft the Institute uh, that, that's, that hopefully will be the, the most impactful that it can be. Um, thanks to Howard for moderating the session. Um, thanks also, yes. 
Thanks to Frank and Kevin for their seamless IT, which we know is not a trivial thing. Um, and also to Anya and, and Carrie Ann for doing about 98% of the organization for today's event. So thank you so much. Um, and I, I see uh, Dean Wichtel at, at the back. So uh, we didn't get a chance to introduce uh, the Dean earlier today at other commitments, but uh, just want to extend our thanks for the support um, for, for this institute. When we first came to, to Cheyenne and, and talked about it, Michelle and I did uh, a while ago and, and Cheyenne became very enthusiastic. Um, we, we needed champions to bring this forward. Uh, and, and, and one of the, one of our biggest champions was, was Jeff. And, and so we're sincerely appreciative of the support that, that he brought this forward to Malcolm's office and it and ultimately ended up in, in a legitimately ratified Institute in the university and, and why we're here today. So thanks very much to you, Dean Mitchell. And that I think brings our formal part of the, of the symposium day to a close. What we have allotted an hour now um, for what we've called networking, didn't know a better term for it, but um, an opportunity for people to interact and have further discussions. So, um, and there's still some coffee and a, a few muffins, et cetera, kicking around. So please make yourself uh, or, or grab whatever you'd like from there and, and take the opportunity if you'd like to, to uh, chat with people and, and continue to share ideas. So, and thanks so much, Trevor. I really appreciated you coming in virtually. I know you had a busy day. Yep, thank you. Um, and and to, all of, to, to all of our online participants that are still here, thank you very much for your participation. Um, we, we're really glad you're able to join us. And for those in person, we'll uh, conclude with our networking session. So thanks. Thanks to everyone.